Thank you. Well, thank you. Good to be back. Uh, thanks, Peter. That was a great tour of how to uh, optimize these drugs once we have our patients on it. As I mentioned earlier in the day, the hardest part of this sometimes is getting our patients on the right drugs in the first place and, and really engaging our patients as part of that team because if they're not part of it, if they don't understand, if they're not sure why to go on these drugs, they might say yes in the office and then go home and decide it's not the right thing for them. Or worse yet, start on a biologic therapy, take a few doses, get nervous about side effects, and then stop and then forever be immunized against that drug so they can't use it any time further. So the work that I've been interested in over the past number of years is really trying to bring patients more into the decision making and using this idea of shared decision making, which I'll define a little bit more uh, formally here. And then also, can we take that a step further? Can we not just give them information so they can make good decisions about their care and understand the benefits and risks of drugs, but is there any way that we can really start to personalize the decision making for patients? so that an individual patient understands if there's somebody with very severe active disease that needs aggressive combination top-down therapy, or are they one of the luckier patients who have a very slow disease course that you can take things a little bit differently and watch how things go and maybe give step therapy into some patients. Surely not all patients need early combination therapy right after diagnosis. We need ways to figure that out, explain that to patients, and allow them to focus on our uh, decision. So this isn't moving along here. I'll let you just put on the right setting. Thanks. Okay. Great. So when, when talking with patients, we oftentimes uh, think of a couple of parts of their disease and how we're making decisions about therapy. The first thing is obviously their clinical characteristics. Who's in front of us? What's that patient like? What's their disease like? And how do we think about decision making for that individual based on what we see? Then there's some other parts that we're learning a little bit more about. We're starting to understand that there's some markers of disease severity, whether it's genetic markers or serolo serologic markers, although independently they don't really help us on their own, but can we combine that with other things to learn more? And then finally, and I would argue the part that's most important, the thing that really drives if your patient will actually go on that medication, are their preferences for treatment. Do they feel comfortable with it? Do they understand it? Do they trust you? Do they trust that the medications are better for them than they are harmful? And that's really this part of shared decision making to bring them into it. We have to remember that when we see patients in the office, what's important to them is not the same as what's important to us. We just spent a lot of time this morning talking about targets. We could fuss about histologic remission versus endoscopic remission or steroid-free remission. That is not what our patients are thinking about when they're sick in the office and talking with us because they don't feel well. It's these very basic things on the bottom. They just want to feel better. They want to leave the house and not worry about bringing that kit that Dr. Irving showed us his patient brought to the office in case they have an accident. They want to be comfortable that they can go to college and live with a roommate and not be embarrassed. They just want to feel better and have this in the background of their lives. And that's the first thing that we need to address with them. We shouldn't be thinking about histologic healing or endoscopic healing at first. We first need to simply make them better and make them understand that they need to feel normal, they need to avoid hospitals and surgery, and then we can fine tune things over time. I'm not suggesting we ignore those things, but to remember that our patients really have these important things at the very heart of what they're worried about as opposed to the nuances that we talk about at these meetings. So I'll talk about the concept of shared decision making. I'll review what we know about predictive factors for Crohn's disease. If we can use predictive factors to sort out those patients who are high risk, can we then focus our full armamentarium of what we know? about best drugs, how to combine them, how to, how to monitor them like Dr. Irving just taught us, and really use our best resources. But do we have to do that in all patients? I would argue we don't, and we'll talk about uh, and we'll show a, per a personalized risk prediction tool that we've developed that we're starting to use now and help us guide our therapeutic decision making. So what are the issues? Well, personalized medicine is here and for the future. The nice slides we saw earlier today are exactly right where we're trying to figure out exactly the type of disease somebody has, what drug they will respond to based on their genetic or serologic or something else profile, and then think about using that directed targeted therapy. That is exactly where we need to be. I will tell you we are years away from that happening, although we can start moving in that direction. We might know the most effective treatment plan for our patient at the time, but does our patient understand it? 
Does our patient really get why we're giving them two what, seeming, what seem to them as powerful drugs right after diagnosis, where that's not the way we've done anything in life? None of us start off with the, with the deep end of the pool or the very aggressive way of treating something. Typically in life, our philosophy is start with something more mild and then move up to something more significant over time. And we have to realize, again, where our patients are coming from, and we have to help educate them why Crohn's disease is different than what they've been dealing with in the rest of their lives. And we have to try to uh, help them understand and agree with the recommendation. So shared decision making is the process of interaction with patients who wish to be involved with their health care providers in making medical decisions. There are a couple of important parts of this definition. It's patients who wish to be involved. Not everybody does, and that's okay, but we have to identify who those patients are, and then we can guide them. Then we can give them a paternalistic view of medicine, of giving them a, a prescription and hoping that they do it, but we have to try to sort out the patients who want to be involved with their decisions, and it's most of their patients. People typically come in three different flavors. One is those who want to have a passive role in decision making. They would just like to sit there and have you tell them what to do and trust you and trust the fact that you know what's best for them. There's the active role on the bottom, which are those patients who come in with the latest Lancet or New England Journal of Medicine article or the recent printout from Dr. Google and try to tell you exactly how they want to be treated because they've done so much research. And you know what? In many cases, they're right and they know exactly what they need. But we have to recognize that some people come in really trying to take charge of what their care is. But most people want this collaborative role. They want to work with their doctor. They want to understand what you think. And they just want to understand why you think it, not just what you think. And that's the part of shared decision making that's challenging, is trying to get them to understand why you're recommending therapy as opposed to just that's your recommendation. We ask patients this with inflammatory bowel disease of which one of these three roles do they like to take and to no surprise at least in the United States this is a broad uh, population in the US that we also looked uh, in patients in Australia that were the same although perhaps it's different here but we found that almost all patients nearly 90 percent of patients said yes they very much want to be involved in their decisions they want to understand not just what the treatments are but why those treatments are being offered to them. So what are the tools that we have? None of us have enough time in the office to give what we've already seen as a, a full day of lectures and another day tomorrow to try to understand what we're doing with inflammatory bowel disease. You might have just a few minutes in the office to try to help engage your patients and educate them. And it's a very complex thing to do because our field is complicated. However, there are tools to do this. There are things called decision aids, which are tools for shared decision making that are developed for preparing patients for a decision about a specific treatment choice. This isn't a handout that you get from the pharmaceutical company that teaches them about the drug. This is a tool developed to help people understand what their options are so they can weigh those options against each other and then make a decision that's right for them. They've been going on for a long time. The initial ones of these, I don't know if these ever made it to your country, were these laser discs that were about this big. They were popular in the United States probably in the mid-1990s. Everybody bought these laser disc players, and then they completely went out of business when regular CDs came out and started becoming popular. Of course, you could just make paper forms because the technology gets outdated and you don't want to make something that's going to go away immediately. And you need something that's inexpensive for people who don't have access to the internet. But of course, most of these that are being done now are internet-based tools that are made for individual treatment decisions in different diseases. Essentially what they are, it's a presentation of evidence-based information in a patient-friendly format. How can we take things that we've seen all morning today and turn it into a way and get rid of p-values, get rid of relative risks and present it to patients in a fair way so they understand what they're getting with these medications when we're offering them to them. Decision aids are not new. These have been around for a long, long time. In fact, here's a systematic review of decision aids. I argue you can't find a systematic review probably in all of gastroenterology that included 115 studies and 34,000 patients. This is a very sophisticated and well-developed field that has shown that using tools such as decision aids will help enhance knowledge, will give more accurate risk perceptions, more realistic expectations of treatment, greater participation in decision making, fewer people who leave the office remaining undecided, improve patient and provider communication, 
and greater comfort with decisions and lower decisional conflict. Decisional conflict is this idea of that angst that our patients feel when they heard you, they see the prescription, they understand what you want them to do, but they just don't feel comfortable with it. And the higher decisional conflict is, the less likely they are to take the medication when they go home, and even if they do start it, the less likely they are to stay on the medication. I will tell you that at least in the United States, interestingly, and not surprisingly, the higher decisional conflict, the more likely their doctor is to be sued in a lawsuit if something goes wrong. Because patients want to feel comfortable with what they're doing and not forced into what they're doing. So IBD is perfect for shared decision making. We have data to support being more aggressive with therapy, but there are a few problems. Big problems. Patients are scared of the medications. Providers are scared of the medications. This isn't all about patients, but if you sit there as a provider and start kind of showing worry in your eyes that they're going to develop tuberculosis, cancer, sepsis, and death, they're not going to go home and take the medication. We need to be confident and understand the data, the excellent safety data that we have on our medications. And both patients and providers don't understand the implications of undertreated disease. I think this is the number one reason people don't go on the right medications early. It's not that they're scared of the medications. It's that we as providers don't feel they've earned it yet. They haven't been sick enough yet for us to really offer these drugs. And patients don't feel that they've been sick enough yet to earn these drugs that they read about on the internet as chemotherapy and having scary side effects. It's not the side effects they're worried about. It's the fact that they don't feel they deserve it because they don't understand that Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis are progressive and are going to lead to more trouble for them over time but they don't feel that sick right now, so that projection into the future is a really hard thing for people to understand. So in choosing Crohn's disease therapy, we have to rec you know, recognize that not every patient needs top-down or early intensive therapy. We need to determine who has high risk versus low risk disease, and then we have to help patients and our colleagues understand this risk. So can we develop some tools to get that done? What we're really trying to do is predict the future, and this is hard, and we know how uncertain the future is, but what's the best we can do, at least, in thinking about seeing a patient in the office and understanding what path they're going to go down over the next three to five years so that we could feel more comfortable treating aggressive disease aggressively, but letting some patients go more slowly and use a step care therapy plan in those patients who aren't too sick. Some of this work came up a little earlier. This was initial work done by Marla Dubinsky. Peter just referenced our colleague and friend Marla as well, who looked at this in kids and showed us that there's something really interesting here. We can look at serologic markers, which had often been out there commercially to help diagnose Crohn's disease versus ulcerative colitis. I would bet you, like I, find that's not very helpful that we can check these markers in the patients who have Crohn's disease, it says they have Crohn's disease, and the patients who have ulcerative colitis, it says they have ulcerative colitis, and the patients you're not sure, it says it's not sure. So I don't find that very helpful. However, if you look at the absolute magnitude of the antimicrobial responses to these antigens, the higher they are, the more trouble patients get in. It's probably something about mucosal permeability or their, or their body's immune response. But as you can see here in this early work, the chance of having penetrating, stricturing disease or surgery goes up the number of and higher your immune, sponsors, your immune responses are to antimicrobial antigens like ASCA and SIBR. ANCA, which is typically an ulcerative colitis marker, is protective against complications for Crohn's disease because it probably represents that UC-like phenotype that doesn't cause complications. Otherwise said, you can take the information you get from serologic markers and use it as a guide, but it's not enough. It's not nearly predictive enough, and we have to put it together with other things to try to make a go at it. So this is the work we've done. It's not the definitive work. I look at it as the first step in a, in a direction that we all need to think about and add to. But this is work trying to develop a risk prediction tool using everything that we know about serologic markers, genetics, and clinical characteristics so that we can make some prediction that doesn't just inform us as providers, but that we can share with our patients and help our patients get it, help our patients understand why we're worried about them and why we want to treat them more aggressively. This work uses an interesting technique called system dynamics analysis. This isn't something that's been used in medicine uh, really ever before, other than in some isolated situations. It's a tool used by engineers. It's sometimes used in the pharmaceutical company. It's sometimes used in economics to help using complex 
variables that come together that may interact in unpredictable ways. And it also gives us the ability to visualize the results of this. I am very lucky that I've been able to learn about this. It turns out that the, f f by far the smartest person as part of this work is my wife, Dr. Lori Siegel, who's a PhD in engineer, who does her work around climate change and builds complex models looking at how climate change is going to affect different parts of the world. And it was only after watching her get her PhD over a period of about eight years that I said, huh, I think I understand what you're doing, finally. I was pretending I understood what you were doing for the past six years, but now I thought I understand it a little more. What she was doing was taking a complex system with multiple variables and trying to predict very difficult to predict outcomes in the future, and we thought, I bet we can do this with Crohn's disease, let's try. And that's been the evolution of this work over the past five, six, or seven years. So system dynamics is a methodology that addresses inherent dynamic complexity between variables. It's not that different from multiple logistic regression. But what it allows us to do as an advantage is it provides a real-time, individualized prediction of outcomes for an, a, for an individual at a moment in time. It has a very simple input control paddle, and then it graphically displays the outcome over time. And I'll show you what that looks like in a minute. It wasn't developed to do this. Again, system dynamics analysis was not meant to be a patient communication tool. But ultimately, what it allows us to do is take complex clinical data and turn it into a patient-friendly result so that we can all understand it and work with it with, with our patients. The first level of doing this is a standard Cox proportional analysis. If we were doing standard statistical analysis, this is where it would end and this is what the manuscript would look like and you may or may not ever read the manuscript and then you would never talk to your patients about it because I'm not sure what you're supposed to tell them about their hazard ratio when they have multiple complex variables interacting with each other. It's uninterpretable and not something that you could use in clinical practice. So first we wanted to make sure the model was, was secure before we put in the system and dynamics part of it. And what we saw is when you see, look at variables in a large group of adult patients with Crohn's disease, and the outcome is time to complication of Crohn's disease. This is from today. How long will it take for that patient, if ever, to develop internal penetrating disease, a stricture, or have an abdominal surgery? I think that's what our patients care about. They care if they're going to get into trouble that require surgery. And when we pilot tested this with patients and did a lot of focus groups with patients, in fact, that's what they did tell us, that they wanted to prevent surgery, and if they knew they were at a high risk for surgery, then they would do whatever they could to stay away from that. So the variables that shook out in this model are small bowel disease is a risk. Interestingly, left colonic disease is protective. Again, probably more of a UC phenotype than those with Crohn's disease. Perianal disease is a complication that predicts further abdominal complications and abdominal surgeries. ASCA, which is the serologic marker. CBER, another serologic marker. ANCA is protective for reasons we already mentioned. And then interestingly, one of the NOD2 mutations, called the NOD2 frame shift mutation. And when you put this all together in a predictive model and look at the predictive ability, when you're thinking of what the C statistic is, or it's called the Harrell C, it comes to 0.73. That's actually pretty good. Anything over 0.7 is considered good to excellent for predictive value. So we were very happy where that came. However, when you build a model, you can't just say how well it performs in the cohort of patients that you built the model in. That actually is interesting, but not helpful. You need to look in other cohorts and make sure that it represents the same thing in completely different groups of patients. And that's what we did. We went to a completely different group of patients, actually in Canada, Dr. Mark Silverberg's, uh, Silverstein's group, who had an amazingly well-characterized group of patients with the same blood test that we needed, and in fact, it behaved the same way with a predictive value of 0.73. And then we went to a pediatric cohort to see if we can use this in kids, and it was just about the same as well. So we felt pretty confident that this model that we had built mathematically was useful and fair and relatively accurate. But then we had to build this into the system dynamics model so we could show it to patients. And that's where we worked with uh, my wife Lori's group at Climate Interactive, uh, the folks at Cedar sinai where Marl Dubinsky had been at the time, our group at Dartmouth, and then a very interesting group called Libba. If you're a music fan, uh, Libba was started by the son of Bob Dylan, uh, the musician. 
And Bob Dylan's son is equally as creative, but in many different ways. He has one son, Jacob Dylan, who's in a great music group called The Wallflowers, but this is his other son who developed a web-based interaction patient education uh, company that builds tools to help patients and, and parents better communicate with their doctors. So just the fact that I was getting emails with the name Dylan on it made it fair enough for me and interesting to continue this work. And the work that we uh, called this is called Prospect, which is the Personalized Risk and Outcome Prediction Tool. This is what it looks like. It's a web-based tool, so patients get an email, and they can click on that email, and it brings them to the screen. It's interactive, so they can hover over certain things and learn a little bit more, but let me walk you through it. It says the patient's name on it. That sounds silly, but it's incredibly important when you read the literature about patient interaction and patient engagement, that if it has their name on it, their date of birth, their diagnosis, they much more quickly believe that this is them and not some generic uh, thing that they're getting from a pharmaceutical company or somebody else. It says on top, based on the specific characteristics of your Crohn's disease, the graph below shows your risk of developing complications such as fistulas and blockages, which often lead to surgery. And what's interesting when we worked with patients is they, they told us how they wanted this developed. You'll see that there's no percentage uh, numbers on the y-axis here, which we would expect to see as providers. But patients told us that the percentage actually didn't matter to them. They didn't care that much if it was 67% or 82%. They just wanted to know if they're a low, medium, or high risk. And that's why the chart looks like this. Some patients said they'd still like to know, so you could click on the percent sign in the top right-hand corner, and then it'll convert it to numbers there so they can see exactly where they are. But this was really driven by patients. It's color-coded. It's simple. One would argue there are uh, confidence intervals around that line. That line is an overestimate of the point estimate, but we tried, we tried confidence intervals around it, and patients really hated it. It really confused them. They look at the extremes. They don't understand central tendency in general, so we took them away, and, and showing that they're in either the red, the yellow, or the blue, we felt that that was probably accurate enough that they're giving a, a, a fairly reasonable prediction of, of where their risk would be. They can click on other things on here, too. If they hit your Crohn's disease, it'll show them the characteristics that went in to make the prediction for them. And if you hit your treatment options, it brings up something called an option grid, which shows them biologic therapy on its own, biologic uh, uh, thiopurine therapy on its own, and combination therapy, and gives some estimates about response rates and about, and about risks of, of therapy. So I just wanted to show you a couple of patients. This is being used as a research tool now. This isn't available uh, either on the internet yet and not available commercially, but something that we're studying as part of a grant to see if, if in fact it is accurate prospectively and to understand how it affects patient decision making. So I want to show you two patients that I found really interesting that came through my clinic that we use this tool and it absolutely changed the course of our treatment and it really helped. There are others too, but these are two of the best ones. This is a 28-year-old man from Maine, which if you know Maine, it's in a beautiful part of the United States, just in the northeast most part of the U.S., right below uh, Nova Scotia, Canada, really a gorgeous area of the world. Uh, he had moderately active ileal Crohn's disease by any definition. His endoscopy looked moderately active. He had moderately active symptoms. Uh, and his treatment at the time was monotherapy with marijuana. He felt pretty well actually smoking marijuana, and he was gaining weight, and he was eating, and his quality of life was pretty good, and yeah, he had cramps and diarrhea, and he didn't really understand why he needed to do anything differently. In fact, he wasn't sent to me as a second opinion because they ran out of all the therapies and they wanted him to be in a clinical trial. They simply sent him as a second opinion because he refused all therapies. He said he didn't understand why he, didn't, why he needed anything. He felt okay and he would wish his doctors would leave him alone and stop trying to push these drugs on him. So when we met him, we offered him to be in this clinical trial and looking at the model and put him through this prediction model. And in fact, look at what it came out. He had very high serologic markers. With his ileal disease, it made him even higher, and he was not too positive. So over the course of the next few years, he had just been diagnosed about six months ago. Over the course of the next few years, he has nearly 100% risk of developing a complication. Again, complication, a stricture, internal penetrating disease, or needing surgery. We sent this to him on a Tuesday. He got the results, I'm sorry, he saw him in the office on Monday. We sent the results on Tuesday. And then by later that week, he was calling my office, begging us to start him on combination therapy as soon as possible because he was so scared about his disease. 
It wasn't that he was scared of the medications. It's that he didn't understand the implications of his disease. And without question, he wanted to start good therapy. So in fact, he wanted Humira and methotrexate. And he came back for a colonoscopy about nine or 10 months later. And he had complete mucosal healing based on our therapy and based on the treatment that he went on and stayed on. Let me show you another patient, though. This tool isn't made to convince our patients to go on therapy. It's to select the right patients for the right therapy. Here's a 20-year-old woman from Vermont, another beautiful part of the world. You can come skiing there anytime. It's a great time of year now for a little spring skiing. She was at a great uh, institution called the University of Vermont, and she played soccer there, which is a good soccer team. So she was a, a fantastic athlete. She had mild to moderately active disease and some colonic disease. And she thought if she just played more soccer, if she played throughout the year, the more she played, the better she felt. And she also didn't understand why we would ever consider putting her on drugs like Humira or Remicade or Thiopurines, and really came again for a second opinion because she was angry at her doctors who seemingly were forcing her to go on stronger therapies. So we put her through the model as well. But this is what hers looked like. Hers is significantly different. And you as a provider would look at this and say, I'm not so sure this patient is in big trouble. Maybe we can give it a little more time. And when she saw this, she called me and said, see, I was right. I don't need to be on these medications. Can we give it a little more time? And in fact, that's just what we did. I said, as long as you come back somewhere within the year for another colonoscopy, I think it's very fair to see how things go. So she decided to go on some supplemental therapy as well and some natural therapy in addition to continuing to play soccer. And she also came back at about nine months. And she also had complete mucosal healing without addition of any therapy. So indeed, she was right. She very much believed in the decision. She comes for annual colonoscopies now because she understands that this could change over time. But again, we got away without using any therapy in her other than natural therapies and increased exercise, which I wouldn't promote as the therapy of choice for Crohn's disease, but somebody with low-risk disease really worked very nicely. So just to show you in how this is behaving, because now we have about 150 uh, uh, patients who have gone into our study trying to understand if it's accurate. And as you can see, the patients are stratifying out just as you would expect. About 20% are low-risk, nearly 60% are moderate or medium-risk, and 25% are high risk. So we're seeing that patients are sorting out just as we see in the natural history studies. So are patients getting complications? Well, they are getting complications. We can't present all of them. But if you look in the low risk group, there's only about a 10% risk of complications. The moderate risk group is 15%. And then you see that it goes up higher for, the, for almost 30% in the high risk patients. So 30% of patients in the high risk group have already had complications within the first six months of their disease. So we're pretty interested in following this along further and hoping that we can enhance this model and learn more from it over time. The last thing I'll show you are these videos, and these videos are now available, and they're available on the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation website. And I have the uh, link to it at the end of the at the end of this. If your patients, if the uh, if the English is okay, uh, it's something that could be very useful. There are about 25-minute videos that go through what these diseases are, what complications are, why we're worried about complications, and the benefits and risks of drugs. Again, they're about 25 minutes. They're very nice. I worked with this company called Emmy, who's in Chicago, who developed these tools, and I think they did a very, very nice job on these videos. Uh, in developing this video, we decided we needed to put it together with the risk model. So actually what we're studying right now is how this video and the risk model really change patients' behavior. And can we actually change the course of disease by getting patients to understand why we're worried about them, what the right medications are for them, and get them less worried and the providers less worried about what we're doing. And that's where we end up with this personalized shared decision-making program. We also have them for ulcerative colitis. There's a really nice one for medical therapy for ulcerative colitis. But the one that I have the least to do with, and I think came out really, really well, is one about surgical options for ulcerative colitis that goes through ileostomy versus J-pouch surgery and all the reasons somebody might choose one versus the other. So with that, I hope you can see where I'm coming from here that we need to take a little bit more into account when we're helping patients make decisions that are right for them. It's their clinical characteristics, it's the serologic markers, it's patient preferences. And if they're on board, they're going to do much better because they're going to stay on the right therapies. If you're interested, here are the websites for the tools. I'm happy to share this afterwards. I'm not sure how they would translate to a Spanish-speaking population, but I hope you found this interesting. So again, thank you for having me.